Hi, my name is Fritzi Horseman, and welcome to Compassion in Action. My guest today is Jason Hernandez. Jason Hernandez is an advocate for clemency, process reform, and serves on the board of the Buried Alive Project, which works to eliminate life without parole sentences handed down under federal drug law. Hernandez is known as one of Obama's eight, the first wave of low-level nonviolent drug offenders to be granted clemency by President Barack Obama. While in prison, Hernandez became a respected jailhouse attorney and was paid to work on other prisoners' cases, many of which involved parental rights, child support, and divorce. Hernandez contributed to an op-ed piece to the New York Times entitled The Power of Clemency in January 2018. Also in 2018, Hernandez received a Latino Justice Media Fellowship and a Soros Justice Fellowship. He is developing a curriculum and toolkit to support clemency campaigns, working with the legal clinic at the Texas A&M University School of Law and U New York University. Jason Hernandez, welcome to Compassion in Action. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing pretty good, and yourself? Good. I'm so excited. I mean, it's an honor. I've been, you know, following your work. And how long were you incarcerated? Uh, 17 and a half months. No, 17 and a half years. <laughs> it's a big difference. How, how old were you when you got incarcerated? 21. So what was your sentence? How long was your sentence? Uh, life without parole and uh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 and an 80-year sentence. Can you explain that to me? You've got life without parole, and then what is all this stuff you did, 20, 20, 20? Uh, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, 20 years, 40 years, 40 years, 40 years, 40 years, and an 80-year sentence. So about life without parole, 320 years I uh, was sentenced to. I mean, that's just so dehumanizing. I mean, why don't you think you got the death penalty? Well, it, it is. I think it's, uh, you could probably say life without parole is probably more uh, cruel than the death penalty because no matter what you do you're going to be in there you could be 60 70 80 90 years old till you die of death or i mean of old age or some type of illness uh but luckily you know i was able to uh, uh, to get out and be here talking with you so how did you do it everybody who's watching this is going to want to see and hear how you how you did this well it was a uh, well, I think like anybody, like when I first went in, I was, I was young, kind of like nothing to lose and still had that frame, frame of mind that, you know, yeah, I was a knucklehead and uh, kind of the, also that belief that I'm Mexican, Mexicans, we sell drugs, we go to prison, it's just part of life. And I kind of embraced that life initially and uh, wasn't an, I, I wasn't a model prisoner when I first went in, I was still selling weed. Uh, making wine, drinking wine, things to that extent, stuff that was going on in the prison. I was, I was at a maximum security penitentiary. So uh, it was kind of, it was a little, little rowdy there. And, uh, you know, just trying to show that I can be rowdy too. And I'm, I'm 21 years old, 150 pounds, right? And, you know, uh, just kind of wanted to show I wasn't somebody to be missed with. And I'm not a violent person. My crime was nonviolent. It was a, dr a simple drug, no, not a drug, it was a drug conspiracy. So uh, never been, never have any type of violence in my, in my crime or in my, in my life. But again, I just kind of adapted to this lifestyle in there. And it wasn't until uh, 2002, my brother, who was also incarcerated doing 30 years, uh, he was murdered by two other, three other prisoners. And it was at uh, that moment where, you know, kind of just lost it to an extent. Uh, but just so happens that the prison I was at, some stuff happened and we went on a lockdown and I was in my cell, so I couldn't hurt nobody. Uh, but I wanted to hurt myself, right? And I, I, had, I was gonna kill, I was gonna take my life, I was gonna kill myself. And, uh, you know, the day I was gonna do it, I just, uh, just these, kind of these flashes just went off in my brain where, uh, thinking about my childhood and where there was teachers and even some officers that would tell me, Jason, you know, what are you doing? You know, this is not who you are. You're, you're a good person, you're a good kid. I started selling drugs when I was 15, 15, 16, 17 years old. And, you know, here I, here I am thinking, you know, I was born to sell drugs. I was born to go to prison. But then I said, you know what? I got up, I got up out of my bed and I was I'm looking in this little uh, tin type mirror. 
And, you know, I'm just kind of like not really crying because, you know, you, uh, you know, here I am, I'm a man, I'm in prison, you know, you don't cry, right? You don't let those, you don't let those uh, feelings out. And I just said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to kill myself. I'm not going to take my life that I'm going to get my, actually get my life back starting right now. And I'm going to live every day. Like I'm going home tomorrow. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but if it takes 10, 20 years, uh, I'm going to do what it takes, uh, not only for that day to happen, but when I get out to be successful as well. And it was honoring my brother's life to where he didn't die for nothing that through the loss of his life, I was going to get my life back and I was going to change better and save thousands and thousands of lives. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I just knew that if I didn't give up and give into the system, that somehow the, you know, the universe and the world and everything would conspire with me and make that, make that vision, uh, uh, a reality. And it just so happens it did. And from that day forward, I started, uh, I became what was known as a jailhouse attorney. I went in and started studying the law. I started doing my own appeals and was doing legal work for other people that were incarcerated. I became pretty good too. I was, I was pretty, I was pretty, it was also like a hustle too, where people would pay me to do their, 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 wouldn't charge them a lot, but just, uh, you know, it's hard that we're, and there's books in there, right? Thick books like this, <laughs> there's a, like a computer where you research, uh, but I liked it and it was, it helped me pass the time and I was helping other individuals out, but all my appeals just uh, went down. I mean, does, it just doesn't, the system isn't fair, right? You think that uh, the prison system and the judicial system ain't fair, while our appellate system is just as, you know, as biased and skewed as everything else. It's just a continuing process. But all that was done in uh, uh, 2010, I read a book called the, uh, uh, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And <laughs> right, have you heard of it? Of course, it's my job. So, you know, I read that book and when I read it, it was kind of, cause you've always heard, right? Like how, you know, how like, the the system or or whatever the situation is like targets communities of color and I, but i i would always hear this i would just think that people were just talking about conspiracy theories and things like that and again i just thought hey like we, we mexican black people we sell drugs we use drugs we drop out of school we join gangs we go to prison i don't know why we just do it like and i didn't think there was nothing wrong with i didn't think there was nothing wrong with it and i thought that the uh, the, the statistics justified our conduct. But when I read her book, I mean, she eloquently put everything in place from slavery to uh, the period of redemption, re uh, reconstruction, the black codes, black codes, the new Jim Crow, the knowledge of civil rights, uh, the war on drugs that, that was initiated from Nixon uh, to Carter to President Reagan to Clinton and so on and so forth. And I remember reading that book and just so happens we were, uh, we were, we were like on a five hour lockdown when I received it and I read the whole book and it was so weird because then they opened up the doors and I just walk out to my tier and I'm looking around and I'm looking at everybody in the prison and I see life, 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 black, black, brown, five years, eight years, two years, white, white, white. And then I just start thinking of my childhood and my, and my neighborhood and how I live in a predominantly white city, like 85% of the population is white. But when I got arrested, uh, 37 people got arrested in my conspiracy. Of those 37, three people were white people. And I sold to way more white people than I did minorities. But then I just started thinking of people that I was in prison with. And I was like, oh, my God, like there is actually a system, whether it's intentional or not, but that is destroying and disrupting communities of color and it's it's not it's not some type of barbershop talk like this is reality and i fell into it and i brought people with me and i felt like i was bamboozled right like hold on like there's this trap and you fell into it and i was not i was mad at the system but i was mad at myself for not seeing it and contributing to it and i think that if you're going to do anything if you're going to do anything great or transformative in life I think at first that you have to get mad, right? Because when you get mad, what do you want to do? You want to fight. And we're always taught if you get mad, you fight with these. But then I was like, can't, you can't win. You can't win with these in this situation that you have to use your mind. Uh, but the other strong component of Michelle Alexander's book is the last chapter. And it says the fire this time. And it's from a play of words off James Baldwin's book, uh, the fire next time. And it talks, what she talks about is that a new, 
a, a new era of advocates, right? Like, like the people that were in place at that time, whether it was LULAC, the NAACP, or even the ACLU or other organizations, weren't, uh, weren't addressing this issue. And she, how, and they were, they were just kind of turning a blind eye to it. But she said that there's going to be, basically what she said, that there's going to be people that, are gonna, that, that have been directly impacted that are going to take a stand uh, and that they will be more aggressive, that they will be more loud, and that when they do scream, that not to quiet them down because they have reasons for that. And I was just like, you know what? I don't know what I'm going to do, but I need to make people know that I exist, that we exist, because some of the greatest people that I ever met uh, were in prison. We're serving life without parole. Some of these guys are preachers, taught me how to weld, helped me with my GED. Uh, these individuals were not, when you think of somebody serving life without parole and, uh, you know, a black person or a brown person, I, I think people get this uh, 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 perception that there were these, these big kingpins and that they're in prison and that they're just walking around beating up people. And, and that was so far from the case. Like these guys were just extraordinary people, amazing, amazing people. And, I was like, everybody's starting to know the statistics, but they don't know who we are. They don't, they don't know the face and they don't know what we've been doing. And they don't even know our crime. Like I did a bad thing, but I wasn't like Scarface or Nino Brown or Pablo Escobar I was selling drugs in my community as a kid uh, to my friends. And uh, I deserve to go to prison. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I deserve to go to prison. I don't think I deserve life without parole plus an extra 320 years. So I started my own advocacy organization in there called Crack Open the Door. And I'll just kind of give you the short version because I'll give you the long version. It's, it's, it's a lot. But, uh, but I started advocating uh, from prison. Didn't even know what the word advocating, I didn't even know if it, it, it existed, but I was just like, I'm going to fight. All I knew was just fight. I didn't know nothing about advocating. <laughs> I, was just like, I need to fight. I need to get from out these walls to out there and show people who we are. And the other thing too was that I read a book. Michelle Alexander's book uh, says she recommends books to read. And one of them was Barack Obama's Audacity of Hope. So I read it and I had always followed Barack Obama was waiting for him. Hopefully like, man, hopefully this is the, the chance. And he talked a good game on the, on the, uh, 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 on the campaign trail, but I just thought, man, this guy is reading notes about criminal justice. And, you know, he goes on stage and he says what he's fed. But when I read that book, the audacity of hope, he talked about our communities. He talked about the war on drugs and how it was systemic. And I was like, you know what? If I could get this guy, I was like, there's no doubt in my mind that if I can get this guy, the president of the United States, to acknowledge me, to know that I exist, and not so much about my crime, but about who I was, who I am as a person, that I had no doubt that he would release me. I just, I just knew it. But it was like, how does a prisoner get the most powerful man in the world? To, to acknowledge him, right? So my other brother who was incarcerated, who got out, I was like, bro, we got to create, I don't know what a website is, but I'm reading these business books and these business books are telling me, because I was like, every prisoner who's, every prisoner is like, I'm going to get out and open a business. I mean, that's, what, that's like the prisoner's dream. But when I'm reading these books, I'm learning about the internet. I'm learning about Google. I'm learning about Facebook. And when people are going in there in prison, I'm like, hey, tell me about, like, what is an app? what is Facebook? And they're like, oh, you just click on this button and this pops up. I'm like, hold on. What do you mean? Like you click on a button and this pops up. Like, do you have to have a degree? Do you have to pay for this? Like, how does this work? And they're like, nah, like e even kids are doing it. I'm just like, I couldn't grasp it. But then I was just like, oh my God, like this is like almost like some type of virtual reality. So I started creating profiles with toothpaste and I would send them to my brother. I'm like, put this on this website, bro. I knew more about the internet than my brother did. I was like, put this on the internet. You can't do that, bro. I said, you can. I read about it. I read in this business book that you can do this. And we would have these fights. Uh, but then I started writing everybody that you could possibly think of, uh, whether they were senators, House of Representatives, uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, everybody. And I also sent a letter, a personal, I put my own clemency petition together because clemency was the only option that I had left. And I knew that it was rare that somebody would get it especially like if you're a drug offender, uh, somebody serving life without parole, minority, the chances of you getting it is that you don't get it. But again, I just felt I have nothing to lose and everything to gain. But I was like, I, when I sent that petition, I also sent President Barack Obama a personal letter. I sent that to him on September the 23rd, 2011. Kept fighting, kept fighting. Wrote, reached, I wrote a letter to uh, uh, Michelle Alexander. She wrote me back. Nobody wrote me back. When I tell you that I sent hundreds of letters out. I sent out hundreds. Nobody wrote back. The only person that did was Michelle Alexander. She wrote me back and she said, you know what, Jason, I think what you're fighting for, crack cocaine offender serving life without parole, 
is like is an injustice and I can't do nothing for you, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect you to the ACLU. At that time, it was Vanita Gupta uh, who was in charge. So I started connecting her. I was like, look, this is what I'm doing. This is why I think that we deserve a second chance. And they came out with their own report called a living death in 2013, where they focused on uh, nonviolent drug offenders serving life without parole in the feds and in the state system. Like 60 of those individuals I had put them in contact with. And, uh, I think it was two years, two months, and 26 days later, uh, the President of the United States uh, uh, basically writes me back on December 19, 2013, and uh, I was one of the first individuals to receive clemency from him. It was me and seven other people serving life without parole, all crack cocaine offenders, seven African Americans, one Latino, and he commuted all of our sentences uh, to 20 years. That was on December, uh, that was on 2013. I would find out 2018, I would find out that the president of the United States, Barack Obama, actually read my letter. Uh, and that was through, there's a book, another book come, that came out that talked about the letters that he read. And the, uh, the author contacted me and she was like, hey, Jason, I seen that you might have, uh, that you wrote a letter to the president. And I was like, yeah, I did. She was like, uh, well, can can, can I see it? Because we want to include it in this book. And uh, she goes, I got a copy of it, but it's blacked out and I don't have your name or nothing on it. And I was like, well, where'd you get it at? <laughs> she goes, well, I got it from uh, the White House library. I mean, from the White House mail room. And I was like, hmm. I was like, what did they give it to you for? She goes, well, I asked them to give me some of the most important letters that they received during President Barack Obama's uh, tenure for the eight year period. And yours was in that stack. And I said, I want to read I want the letters that are not just the most important, but the ones that President Barack Obama read and yours was in there. And I was like, hold up. What you mean? Like, you mean to tell me like he actually like read my letter? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. Like I had always believed it. But uh, I found out like again, like almost five years after the fact that that the most power. I mean, imagine that. Right. To think that. I was going to, I was going to get in contact with this man. Like I just knew it. I just knew it. Uh, and that it happened. And that from life without parole, 320 years, brother just murdered, you know, eight by six prison cell, no degree, GED, jailhouse attorney. So, you know, if I think about what I can do in that circumstance and those situations, but it, it took persistence. It took, I mean, it was fighting every day, day in, day out and not, and not just giving into the system. But, and I think that's a story, not just for people that are in prison, but, you know, people out here that you can make change. It doesn't matter if you're a grandmother or a kindergarten, uh, you, you, you can, you can make change, right? It's just up to you. But like I said, you got, you got to get mad and you got to be determined. <laughs> you got to want to fight day in, day out, holidays, weekends, but you're, you know, anything's, anything is definitely possible. So that's like the short version. <laughs> I mean, you knew on some level that you were going to connect with Obama on some level, right? Well, the, the visualization was another, the, probably the most strongest, it was the necessity to where, uh, you know, I didn't do yoga when I was incarcerated, but I did the mindful meditation, the breathing techniques, uh, the meditation, and it helped me so much. It, I was so good at it to where I could be in a room like this with 50 other people, prisoners, watching a, a, a Dallas Cowboys game, everybody screaming, and I could block everybody out and I could look at the TV screen and I could visualize uh, my first day out. I could visualize going to the White House, speaking to congressmen, coming back to the jails that I was in, speaking to those kids, to the adults, coming back to the schools that I was at, speaking to those kids about right and wrong. Every, every single one of those that I've done, being on TV, I could picture it as clear as day as I, as I see you here, as I see myself right now in the morning i would walk around the track i would put earplugs in my ear and i would put my headphones on and i would walk around the track and i would just look straight in front of me and i would picture what do i want my future to look like uh i'm gonna get out of prison what do i need to do to get out of here and i would picture myself in the law library i would picture myself uh i even actually i'm gonna tell you what i pictured i said okay this this pardon attorney room where tens of thousands of petitions are at. I visualized what it looked like. And I said, okay, if I work there and they say, go get the next briefs. If I were to walk in that room and go grab the next hundred briefs that people filed, petitions, what would have to be in that room to make my 
attention be dissuaded to turn to that to to something else and i created my petition in a way that it was kind of extra i think that you would call extraordinary from your other regular petitions where not only would that i visualize when this person what make what would make them grab it but then when they opened it what would make them continue reading i i mean i would say what am i going to be doing a week from now to further my goal of getting out of prison honoring my brother's name, giving his life meaning, what am I going to be actually, so I would even actually picture myself uh, doing things in prison to accomplish that goal. And it was, uh, and when I, again, when I tell you I could, it was like, it was so weird because it was almost like I built a car. All I had to do now was just go out there and just turn the ignition to it. But yeah, I mean, I, I wrote a book called Get Clemency Now. And it teaches people how to advocate from the inside and it teaches families how to advocate for their loved ones on the inside. But the last, and it's offered for free. If you go to www.getclemencynow.org, uh, you can view it for free. You can download it for free. If you want to go to Amazon and buy it, you can, but there's really no need to. But in the back of that book, uh, I have like my eight, my eight steps uh, that I, and this is what I put. I said, you could do everything that you want. You could say you can have all this perfect record and do everything in the perfect case. But if you don't do these eight steps on a day to day basis uh, that you're not you're not going to get out. But one of them was that uh, that visualization, that believe in that manifestation that uh, I think that if you I mean, I am telling you have to become obsessed. If you're not thinking about your freedom when you wake up throughout the day. If you're not thinking about your, your freedom uh, when you go before you go to bed, you're not going to get it right. Uh, Another thing too, I would tell you that I would, that I would do, I would be, say if I was just walking somewhere, I would sit, I would walk and if I was walking in the prison yard or in the, in the, in the dorm, I would sit there and I would stop and I would say to myself, I would say, Jason, wherever you just came from and wherever you're going, is it in furtherance of your goal of getting out tomorrow? Is it in furtherance of your goal of staying out? Is it in furtherance of your goal of giving your brother's life, your death, his death meaning? Is it in furtherance of your goal of not changing one life and two lives, but thousands of lives? Where did you just come from? Where are you going? If one of those is not in, in sequence with that, why not? And if it is in sequence with that, what could have you done better to, uh, to better the chances? So the next time that whatever you're doing, that you do it again, but you do it better. I mean, it was, I can't, I can't, I mean, for me, I, I, look, when I tell you that I, I, to be here talking to you right now, uh, because in prison, you don't dictate the circumstances, right? The prison, dict you could be the perfect person, stay out of trouble, but, you know, trouble finds you. And there were times had, had I, if I went left and not went right, or had I went up the stairs or not down the stairs, or had I woke up a minute uh, too soon or a minute later that I wouldn't be here talking with you. I was in prison 17 and a half years. And again, those first five years, I wasn't the best person, but I've never received one incident report in my entire incarceration and uh i was in there i was on an outreach program working with kids i was on the suicide watch program where, where prisoners were thinking about killing themselves they would call me in to mentor them uh i did it i mean whatever <laughs> you, you you name it i did it but uh it it's not easy but is it is it easy hell no is it hard hell yes is it possible you damn right it is right but it's gonna take everything that you got <laughs> for real wow so here's a question. Are you ever going to become a motivational speaker? <laughs> I do, I do uh, talks every now and then. Uh, majority of it's criminal justice reform, but I would love to do more motivational talks. And again, I think that my story just not only applies to people that are in prison or people that have been impacted, but any, any walks of life, whether it's a business, Fortune 500 company, or people who are just struggling uh, and trying to figure out, you know, you know, how do they get out of the situation that they're in? Because as you know, and as I know that, uh, you don't have to be physically incarcerated to be living in a prison, right? I've met hundreds of people out here who are in that, who are in a prison. Yeah, it's called addiction. We're all addicts. We're all like living in our heads. I mean, how many people in the United States are workaholics? I mean, we're all just in our own little prison living here. So, um, so I have a question for you. Um, what are the eight steps? The first one is, is getting, getting mad, right? The first one that I think, again, I think if you're going to do anything, uh, you know what, can I, can I get the book? Yeah. The, this is the, this is the book, get clemency now. And I wanted to put the visual of, of me 
coming out of, of jail. And there's also like, there's stories in here of people, of people who've uh, not only been in prison, but they've came out and they've changed, they've, they're, they're changing the criminal justice system to show people that uh, not only that when you, uh, Tony Morrison says that if you are free, you need to free somebody else, right? So to tell these individuals that when you get out, that to come out and, and, and fight for those that we left behind. And I think that with me as well, I do have that kind of almost, I guess you would say, a survival's guilt to where I left. I feel like I left like a lot of amazing people in prison. And President Obama, he, he, you know, he states that had he been born under different circumstances or had he been born in neighborhoods like us and raised like us, that he could have easily been a prisoner, right? That he could have easily uh, been one of us. And what I always say is that, you know what, had those people in prison been born in your circumstance, like they could have been president, right? Uh, or they could have been an attorney or, or, or a vice president or whatever. But, you know, it's just uh, sometimes people just need a, a second chance. And I think in a lot of our cases, we just needed a first chance, right? Some of them even had a, a first chance. But, you know, so, so, you know like here I put my, my, my personal steps. And one is, is to get mad, right? So that when you get mad, you get that passion. And when, and when you're passionate about something, it's hard. Uh, you're not going to be denied, right? That you're going you're gonna to accomplish. You're going to end up uh, comp- accomplishing that goal because when you get, when you get mad, you want to fight. And you're, you're just not going to give up. You're going to do whatever it takes. You're going to scratch, claw, jump, do whatever. And uh, that's, part of, that's, that's part of the process, right? And I think that once you, uh, you, know, once you get mad, you have, to make, you have to decide that you have to make a declaration. And that's what I did. I mean, right there in that, the day I was going to kill myself in that 8 by 6 prison cell, looking at that mirror, it was, it was like a light bulb. Like right there and then that to me, that was probably one of the most important steps that I had to make though. Cause once I made that decision, that commitment, that declaration to myself and to my brother, there was just no going back. Uh, so I think that second, that second step is, you know, after you get mad, you have to make that, that decision on like, like this is it. And like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going back. You know, if I'm gonna die in prison, I'm gonna die for something that I believe in for, for my, for my freedom, honoring my brother's name. Uh, then I think after that, like, as I said earlier, like you have to be, you have to become obsessed with what you want. If you're not thinking about your freedom or whatever you're trying to accomplish, uh, when you wake up, when you go to sleep throughout the day, that you're probably not going to make it. Uh, whatever your goals and dreams are, whether it's getting out or staying out, uh, that is probably not going to happen. If you want to do something extraordinary, you got to take extraordinary measures. Uh, and I think my story is, uh, is a straight example of that, of the epitome of that. The next one is, you know what you want, but what does, it actually, what, it, what does it actually look like? And then once you figure out what that freedom, what, once you figure out what your goal looks like, then you have to visualize what it's going to take to get there. So that next important step is visualizing and believing, right? You have to visualize it, then you can believe it. And people always say, you know, if I see it, I'll believe it, right? But to me, uh, it was reversed. I believed in it so much that I could see it, right? So it was like, not like I had to see my freedom first and then I'll be ready when if it ever happens. I believed in it so much that I, that I could see it. Uh, so that was the next step. The next one is uh, be great at everything you do, right? And not just say, so if you're putting a clemency petition together, I'm not just saying be great at putting that clemency petition together or anything that's connected to it, that every step, everything in your life, whether you're cleaning your toilet or you're cleaning the warden's toilet, you, 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 you formulate this habit of no matter what I do, I'm going to do it to the best that I can because it, it then becomes a habit that no matter what you're doing, uh, it's, it's innate, right? And that is, an, that is a replica of, of who you are. Again, whether it's cleaning windows, making food, you do it to the best of your capability. And you got to imagine, I'm in prison. I start my own, my own uh, criminal justice reform group in there. It's just me and my brother on the outside. I didn't know nothing about advocating. I got, all I got is toothpaste, uh, don't even have scissors in there, beat down copy machine, a 1970 typewriter. But no matter what I put together, I put it together as best as I possibly could because whoever I was sending it to, I wanted them to know that I might not have a lot in here, but I'm doing it the best that I, that it's a, that it's a, it's a, uh, 
it's almost like a, uh, an example of, of a replica of who I am as a person that I take pride in everything that I do. And even when I, uh, when I get out, the next step is that positive mental attitude, right? I believe that, uh, it's a book as a man thinketh James Allen, I think, uh, you know, he talks about like the, the mind is like a garden, but the, the mind, just like the ground, like a garden, doesn't distinguish between good seeds and bad seeds and it's going to grow either or. So in your mind, if you're thinking about negative stuff, you're going to get negative stuff back to you. For, and in prison, it's extremely hard, but I always looked at every, op every opportunity or everything, even if it was a negative situation, what was the good from there? And I distanced myself from everybody. If they weren't talking about getting out and freedom and bettering themselves and bettering uh, others, really had there really was no kind of connection between us, no reason to hang out. Uh, again, I think that whatever you put out, you're going to get back good or bad. And I think that's what's kind of helped me and saved me throughout day on day after day to avoid those negative situations that where I could have walked into uh, could have probably cost me my life or have kept me in prison uh, because I probably would have to defend myself. But again, I just think that, you know, that positive mental attitude, whatever you give out, you're going to, the world's going to give back to you. The, the next one, you know, if you're going to, if I tell, and I tell people now, I tell kids now, if you want to change your life, you got to change your friends. When my brother, and this was another, I think every one of these is important, but the, this one was extremely important to where I wasn't in a gang, but I was hanging out with people who, like a click, right? We did everything that gangs did. We just weren't a blood in, blood out. But I knew that if I continued to be with them, that it was going to eventually lead to some type of action where I would have to hurt somebody or get into some type of violent act and I would never get out. So no matter how much good I did past that day, that if I were to keep hanging out with these people that I was going to, uh, something bad was going to happen to me. And I already knew, right? I mean, I'm solo by myself, but I go to all the gang members and I go to all these different cars in prison and I tell them, I'm like, look, I'm not with these guys no more. If you have a problem with them, it's with them. But as well, if you have a problem with me, I answer for what I do. You don't go to those guys no more. And everybody told me, they're like, look, Jason, we understand what you're doing. You lost your brother. You know, we respect you. But then they also told me, if something happens, if somebody runs up on you or somebody goes into your cell, you know, you're on your own. You can't say we're with the, you're with these people no more. And I knew that. Uh, but again, like I said, I mentioned earlier, if I was going to die in prison, it was going to uh, die for uh, trying to get my freedom, uh, making my brother's death mean something. And just so happens, uh, everything just, I'm not going to say everything went smooth, but it went smooth enough for me to be here right now. Uh, speaking with you. Yeah. So I think if you're going to, if you're going to change your life, you got you to get all of those negative elements out of your life, right? That's your friends. And sometimes that's your family. Uh, you know, I was, I was in prison 18 years and every time I would talk to somebody and ask them, you know, why are you here? What, what are, you know, what led you to be here? Every single one of them, it, it was my friends. It was, it was the people that I was around. Uh, you know, those are your associates. You, you, you got to evaluate every single one of them. And, uh, I, th I think the last one, take, you have to take control of your life. Uh, there's a book I would recommend everybody read it, not just people that are in prison, uh, by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And you know what's so funny? I have it right here. <laughs> this is the actual, I read this book in 2008, an El Reno FCI. And Viktor Frankl, he was at a concentration camp and it's a real small read. It's about 100 books, 100, 100 pages. But he talks about the last of human freedoms. The last of, you could take everything away from a person. But you can't take away the way a person thinks, right? You control that. No inmate, no guard, nobody can take that from you. But once they do take that from you, that you've lost everything. This book... I didn't, when the day that I left, it was a struggle. Like, do I leave this book here? Because it had done so much for me. But then I was like, man, it could help so many other people out. But then I wanted to bring it with me just because it was, again, I think it was like almost every books are, I mean, they book 
from the new Jim Crow to the audacity, Barack Obama's audacity of hope, man's search for meaning, books that transformed my life. So I had to bring it with me, right? Uh, but I always recommend this to anybody, whatever type of situation you're going through. But again, I think that there's a lot of strong points from this book, man's search for meaning, but that last one that I could not let any prisoner or any guard in there take that last freedom that I had. I, I mean, I lost everything. My, again, my brother, life without parole. But the way that I felt, I was not going to let nobody take that. But there was times where it, it would creep in and I would be like, what are you doing? You can't let that guard control how you feel because once you do, you, you've lost it. There's no going back. But those are, those are my eight steps. They're in the book. Again, they're kind of geared towards people that are incarcerated. But I believe that uh, anybody, whether it's a mother or a father or a kid, any, anybody can take those steps and uh, benefit from them greatly. So do you know about limitlessness? I mean, you're limitless. There's, you have no limits. Like, what's your big goal? Because you know you can get it done. Anything you dream of, you're going to make happen. I mean, this is, an, this is a message, and this is for everyone. Everyone, pay attention to this man, because he knows what he knows. So what's your, what's your next big goal? I want to know because it's going to happen. Well, we're, uh, I'm actually, I just signed a book deal with uh, New World uh, to do a memoir. Uh, I did the, 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 guide, the guidebook for people that are incarcerated. That was a big goal of mine. Uh, when I wrote President Barack Obama, I, well, the clemency campaign was a goal from 10 years ago. So I'm not only part of it, but I'm like the face of it and one of the leads of it. Uh, another thing that I'm doing is when I wrote President Barack Obama, I told him that I wanted to create a program for Hispanic youth uh, here in my community. And just last week, we, I filed all the paperwork and certified 501c3. So uh, that's kind of kind of be my main focus right there, the memoir, the clemency campaign, and the Latino high school program. So those are the things that I'm, some of the things I'm working on, there's other stuff too as well. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so it just goes on, right? How to just... So I know you work for the ACLU. What do you do? What is your job? I just recently launched a nationwide clemency campaign to try to reduce the prison population and not on a federal level, but on a state by state level. So I'm one of the leads on that. Uh, I guess you could say the, uh, one of the leading faces of it as well, along with Centoya Brown. So what are you doing on this campaign? We're, uh, initially targeting five states in the, uh, uh, all across the United States, five different states where we feel we have an opportunity to go in there and a connection and relationship with the governor. And uh, we're seeking the release of overall 50,000 uh, 50, people that are in prison over the next four years and hopefully more, but at a minimum 50,000. Jason, it's truly been an honor to talk with you today and hopefully we can continue this conversation for many more years to come.